Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, our panel weighs in on America's chaotic departure from Afghanistan, a bill for stronger penalties for violent protesters and a win in the fight against hunger. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. The number one topic of conversation this week, the United States chaotic departure from Afghanistan. After 20 years in the Mideastern country on a counterterrorism mission, over $2 trillion spent, more than 20,000 U.S. soldiers and officers wounded and 2,300 dead, President Joe Biden announced on April 14th he would make good on the previous administration's deal with the Taliban to pull U.S. and NATO troops out of Afghanistan by May 20th, before the 20th anniversary of 9-11. The world has been horrified by the scenes and stories of both innocent civilians and Afghan allies to the U.S. attempting to flee the country by any means necessary, while the Taliban swiftly moved in and claimed victory and possession over the country in a matter of days. Our panel is here to give their perspectives, and I want to welcome Lamicia Whittington of Advance Carolina, political analyst Steve Rao, and Harold Eustish of the Forsyth County Republican Party. Thanks so much, all three of you, for being here. And this morning, I want to start off with you, uh, Harold. You are a U.S. Army veteran, having served with honor combat missions in Afghanistan with the 101st Airborne Division. Were you surprised by the disturbing scenes we've all witnessed over the last several days? Yeah, I think I, I was surprised. I think everybody was surprised on some level that this went so poorly. Um, I, I am for getting out. Uh, most of the guys that I serve with, that I've talked with over the last uh, several weeks um, are for getting out. And so the issue is not that. The issue is kind of what happened. And to see it go down like this um, is really unfortunate. And I think it's, it's it, it, of course, for a lot of us, it goes right back to um, the guys that we lost over there, um, just all the things that happened there. Um, I was there in 2009. It was a very chaotic year. I was on the Pakistan border um, with my team, and it, it was a tough year. And we we did a lot of missions with the Afghan army, and um, they, they were embedded with us. And I, I, it was, um, they were less than stellar, without question. We'll expand and, on that a little bit, because I think that the American people, even though we've heard so many different reports, here you are, you were actually over there. What can you share with us about the terrain, about the preparation of the Afghan army that to help us understand the challenges that uh, Americans were facing over there in trying to uh, help? Yeah. I think the biggest challenge is the American military is good at training Americans. And the Afghan culture is about the most um, opposite of a culture you could have on earth from the United States. So just the cultural sort of difference in American soldiers trying to teach Afghans, you know, saying, you know, you need to be in formation at zero eight and Afghans don't have a, uh, their perception of how time is important versus how we think it's important is just culturally different. Um, every bit of trying to train them just it, it, se it seemed not to work when I was there, um, and and there was a trust issue there. I mean, because there were there were issues where Afghan soldiers were reported of, of killing American soldiers. So those instances really eroded trust, and, and you know, I, I just don't know how well they were actually trained. It looks like, it, it, and I think the other thing is that the Taliban had twenty years of fighting American soldiers to get better at actually fighting. So the Taliban is well-trained, well-equipped, and uh, you know we saw what happened. And this was understood. Lamicia, let me ask you, you also have a personal connection uh, with uh, the, the war effort in Afghanistan. Tell us about that uh, connection and your thoughts on how the uh, U.S. pulled out and also just the desire to leave. Right. Um, so first, you know, just give an honor to Harold, really, you know, just your service. Thank you um, and to other servers. Um, and just saying that in place of being a former uh, military spouse of the United States Air Force um, and having a spouse that was uh, deployed in Afghanistan, 
Um, it was horrific. Uh, you know, for many of our spouses, we understand the sacrifice, the investment our communities have always served. Uh, you know, I have family dating back to the Revolutionary War. And so we understand that it is economic mobility. We understand that it's opportunity for a better life, but it's also servicing our country. And that's the hope, right, that we are protecting um, our, our country. And so that's what was told to our service members and to the spouses was that, you know, it was about stopping the Taliban from the Taliban from invading uh, the United States again uh, to not repeat 9-11. But then it was the fear and the hurt of being on the phone and hearing um, the sounds of mortars that I thought were fireworks. Um, and my spouse trying to hide that. The sound of bombs where there were civilians that the U.S. government would actually employ um, civilians from Afghanistan to work on the base. But as Harold mentioned, that tension of mistrust because our goal as a nation was not actually to go in to uh, rebuild the economy, it was to train a military. So you have folks still in poverty that just came out of the Taliban rule that is still weary of another foreign invader. That's how that we were seen. And so individuals would come on base and unfortunately, you know, engage in, in violence and, and suicide bombing and understanding that, you know, I remember my spouse, we went offline and just hoping that I didn't get that call, but other spouses in our division did get that call. And so it's just understanding our purpose when we went wasn't about reestablishing the economy. It wasn't really about supporting the families in that sense. It was still families living in poverty and under fear of a new invader while our folks were still servicing our country in a way that we felt was patriotism at the time. And so some of that has changed. But yes, it is hard for military spouses and honor to our service members. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for your courage as well. Certainly, Harold, uh, for your patriotism and your service in the, in the military. Steve. Let me get you in on this because the president's moves, the administration has been roundly criticized, but we knew it was going to be chaotic. Is the criticism justified and, and where is it justified and where is it not? Well, I think the criticism, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Harold for his service to the nation. And, uh, you know, my late father-in-law was a U.S. Air Force colonel, and he always taught me you can't thank veterans enough. So I want to thank all of you who served the nation and those who lost their lives in defense of our country. Uh, but on that note, Deborah, I will say that uh, I think the criticism, um, I, I, first of all, I want to say that President Biden had inherited uh, a situation where President Trump had agreed already in May to pull out the troops. So uh, I think we have to look at a president that's dealing with a lot of different challenges up front, from COVID to uh, you know, insurrection on democracy and now uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I think the criticism. Um, is warranted not only for this president, but for the three presidents before him on the strategy for Afghanistan. Uh, if you look at, you know, President Bush really didn't focus on this. Then you had President Obama that did to get out bin Laden, which was the objective, and he succeeded. But he kept the troops there. And then uh, it continued uh, with um, President Trump. And then slowly we wanted to get out. And the question, though, I think we have to ask ourselves, and I want to pick up on something Harold said, is the why. You know, why, why, we, why are we not succeeding when we go in with a foreign presence, military presence, 300,000 coalition forces, a trillion dollars spent, 2,300 lives lost? And I tell you why I think it is, and it's a criticism of just U.S. foreign policy, is that when we go into a country without a legitimate, strong government, uh, and we're not able to effectively train these individuals, and they're fighting for nationalism. The, the nation of Afghanistan's identity has been defined always by foreign invasion, whether it was the British, whether it was the former Soviet Union, and now the United States of America, right? And Afghanistan, you know, I'll end with this. Over the last decade or 15 years, they've seen improvements in their economy. Uh, the treatment of women are more involved in the economy, uh, health care. But I'm um, still just not um, succeeding with the institutions of democracy. They're just not strong enough. And I think that that's the challenge is we have to have a state that provides solid government and can eliminate chaos. But you need to have a society where you can have civil rights and a free society. And I just think so. I actually now, even though with resistance, with a hesitancy, I, I do under, I think the president did the right thing because it's going to happen sooner or later. Right. And the, the, the challenge, too, is just understanding that that's a completely different culture and uh, there's an American interest, there's a civilian interest to see 
things happen the way that they're happening here in the U.S., and that doesn't mean it's uh, something that's going to be acceptable in another nation. I want to turn to this idea of terrorism, because the reason why we were there is to make America safer by trying to contain terrorism in another nation. But here we have in our own country the issue of domestic terrorism. It played out just yesterday in front of the Library of Congress as a North Carolinian threatened uh, the, the area um, by saying that he had, had bombs. Now, he made it out alive. But I want to get your thoughts, um, and I'll, I'll open up with you, Steve, again, uh, on where is our concern with regard to domestic terrorism and what's happening right here in our own nation? Well, I mean, this is a, a challenge that we've continued to see uh, in, in terms of just, you know, weapons out there, people uh, manufacturing their own bombs. Uh, you know, we had the insurrection on the Capitol uh, where, you know, property was being damaged and ransacked. And I've, I've re read studies that domestic terrorism is actually the worst threat uh, to our own security in the United States of America. So, um, you know, we've actually worked on, you know, Secretary of State Blinken has confirmed and says that we are prepared for terrorist attacks from abroad, that we're better prepared than we were in 9-11. And the data and intelligence shows that. But I truly believe that we are not prepared uh, for terrorism here. I mean, there's mental health issues in terms of why people are doing this. Why are guns and weapons and ammunition, you know, semiotic machine guns getting in the hands of these folks? Well, let me, ta well, let and me take off on that and, and, and get a question to you, Harold. Are we in jeopardy here in our nation with regard to domestic uh, protection and, and protecting ourselves against domestic terrorists? How are we doing? Uh, well, I mean, domestic terrorism, terrorism has always been an issue in this country, and I think it obviously still is. But I also think the issue is what do we define as terrorism? And that, that becomes this sort of political question because and it becomes this kind of political football where, where we're always looking to score political points. And I think that's unfortunate. What I mean by that is, you know, even the person yesterday um, that... Uh, you know, had this bomb threat, they're saying, well, he had some posts that may have shown he was, um, he voted for Trump. I mean, what, what is that? You know, half the country voted one way or another. Um, I don't, you know, I, I just think it's unfortunate that, that that's where we look at stuff. And on the other side, you know, I think... Um, but he was down there threatening. Yeah, yeah, he, he was actually on, in the act of, of threatening. Right. We have to, the country have to be vigilant on you know, anybody that makes a threat to anyone, any of our citizens, no matter what their political affiliation is or isn't, doesn't matter. Right. Um, so, yes, I think it's important that we, we stay vigilant there. Absolutely. Thank you, Harold. You know, we're talking about violence in our own nation, and the North Carolina Senate could soon vote on a bill to impose tougher penalties on violent protesters during demonstrations. Legislators say House Bill 805 would protect businesses from the kind of destruction that occurred back in the summer of 2020 during the protests in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. Others are concerned that this is an imposition on First Amendment rights. Let me start off with you, L.A. What are some of the pros and cons of this legislation if it goes through? Sure. So I don't see any pros, right? So let's be very frank. Um, when we talk about domestic terrorism, we talk about the state of our nation. We saw uh, what happened and occurred at our Capitol right at the top of this year. That was an example of a riot, domestic terrorism. What we're seeing across the United States right now, and it is predominantly GOP, uh, let's just be frank, lawmakers in 34 states have introduced 81 anti-protest bills. And more than 400 bills with provisions that restrict voting access have been introduced in 49 states. So 400 anti-voter bills in 49 states. So North Carolina's 805 is just a part of the strategic attack on civil liberties, on our right to protest, our right to assemble. This legislation, let's be very clear, there are already laws in place that protect property damage. This does not expand that protection of property. So then that's gaslighting and a complete smoke and mirrors to say, oh, this protects against incidents of damage against bodily harm and, and damage to property if the law already exists. I'm going to put a few elements so that we can really ground what 805 is about. One, it increases protesting to a felony level that would actually require 16 and 17 year olds if they are charged to go into adult court. 
for, a, guess what, a felony conviction that impedes their right not just to vote, right, if they're convicted, that also eliminates their ability for Pell Grants, employment opportunities, and the like. This increases felonies for our children. And the language riot in this bill is simply too vague. It actually doesn't define the activities of what would consist of a riot. It gives the discretion and the authority to a law enforcement on the ground to determine what they see fit as a riot, as long as it's three or more people. That means that the individual doesn't have to be responsible for the harm to property. They don't have they can be in proximity. They can be out past curfew. It's too vague, especially when we see in the wake of George Floyd and, and the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, state sanctioned violence, our communities already don't trust because of state sanctioned violence. And so this bill, absolute problem for our communities. Harold, you're a lawyer. Is the language too vague at this point? Can they tamp it down, narrow things down? No, I think the language is great. I, I, I had a conversation with some of the authors of this bill yesterday. Um, and uh, there was a lot of effort made in this bill with, with lawyers um, trying to make sure that this bill was done right. And I think it is done right. And, you know, I, I take exception to the whole it's an anti-protest bill. It, this is against rioting, against violence. We saw, you know, uh, a billion dollars in damage nationally um, and damage all around the country um, from these from these riots. You know, nothing wrong with protests, but from riots. And this would this is not a political thing necessarily. This would be, uh, you know, what what happened in Charlottesville would be the same as you know what's hap what happens in Portland. And it's it's just any sort of rioting and damage is important to protect business owners or many minority small business owners who are who were affected by rioting um this protects them uh so this is to me this bill is is written correctly and i think this and this bill actually is a little different than some of the other bills in other states i think it's written um more precisely and i i do think some of the other states do have some issues of vagueness but i don't think that's true here do you think, L.A., that um, what Harold has said in terms of how careful the legislators have been in crafting this would be of any comfort to those who you certainly have worked uh, side by side with in some of the protest activity? Absolutely. And so, you know, uh, as a member of the North Carolina Black Brown Policy Network and with ACLU and other really like on the ground groups um, such as Reps and Emancipate NC, it really impacts our rural communities, our people. Elizabeth City has been protesting for 100 days and no damage to property or bodily harm. We didn't see this legislation, and I'm quoting um, actually Kerwin Pittman and uh, uh, some other groups on the ground that said, we didn't see this type of legislation when individuals took to the street uh, after a Duke game or after a UNC Chapel Hill game. We only saw this legislation after uprisings and protests. And here's the thing, the riot language, plain and simple, we've been engaged, we've had conversations with legislators around this. Here's part of the problem. The discretionary of rioting being vague means that churches who are marching to the polls, guess what? The wrong governing law enforcement body on the ground can deem that a riot. Divine nine fraternities and sororities who are strolling to the polls, that can be deemed a riot. Now, uh, sporting games and folks who do take to the streets, that can be deemed a riot. What is the limit? And at this point, it is an anti-protest and an anti-voter bill, especially when the fact remains it impacts and impedes and takes our ability to assemble and unify and protest, which is our historical right. Our ancestors and elders have done this in the civil rights. That's how we gained our civil rights legislation and our Voting Rights Act. And that is tampering on our ability to have our constitutional right to speak, assemble, and to be with one another. Well, Steve, what, considering the speed with which this uh, legislation is moving through the legislature, what are your um, guesses about it's getting passed within the next several days? Because the House has already passed this bill. Mm -hmm. and. It's with the Senate right now. Yeah, well, I think there is Democratic bipartisan support for this, so I do think it's going to pass. And uh, you know, I look, I, I agree with what Harold said and and, and what Lamicia said. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I think that, you know, I, I believe that the good thing about the bill is we definitely want to prohibit uh, destruction of property and those kinds of things. But but I think those laws were already on the books. So my thing, my idea would be. Rather than rushing a bill through like this, I would rather us see first identify the reasons people are protesting, uh, you know, in terms of racism, uh, disenfranchised communities, and make sure, yes, that when people protest, it's peaceful protest. And to let any city know that if you're coming in and you're bashing glass in a restaurant or you're damaging property or you're using something that you shouldn't be using, that you should be uh, charged with the crime. The problem and, is you know, that a lot of the protesters have been peaceful and it's been outsiders 
who had been able to come right. in and inflict damage. And there was just really terrible damage that occurred in, in many cities in North Carolina. So nobody wants that. Um, small businesses, black owned as well, were damaged in the process. So it's figuring out how do we protect these businesses, but also protect the rights of those who wish to protest and understand and not make the assumption that when people are down there protesting, that they're inflicting violence as well. Right. Starting in October, there will hopefully be fewer families hungry in America. President Biden recently approved the biggest food stamp increase since the program began. The increase brings to $79 billion the annual spend for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP. There are concerns about the sustainability of the increase. And I want to open up with you, L.A., how many Americans you think will be impacted by this move and, and how much of a difference will it really make? Sure. So SNAP already um, assists in feeding more than 42 million Americans, right? And so this benefit increase is the biggest in the program's nearly 60-year history. It'll be a 30% permanent increase in resources to purchase food for those 40-plus million Americans. So the 42 million, they'll just have an expansion of assistance resource-wise to be able to purchase food. We saw in the wake of pandemic a historic shuttering of job closures, and food banks and pantries were actually to max. They didn't have enough food to actually help people in addition to school age children. And so this expansion will, you know, not only help folks in pandemic, but we were also already in a deficit before pandemic. Hunger and child hunger was an extreme problem. In the United States, there was an estimated 17 million children struggling with hunger. That's that's six uh, million before the pandemic, right? Six million before the pandemic. And so when we talk about that increase in hunger, when we talk about hunger that was before pandemic, this is because guess what? Gentrification, zoning laws, food insecurity, food deserts. These were economic depravities that faced everyday communities before pandemic. So guess what? The expansion of SNAP is behind times, but it is on time because our folks have to be able to survive. And we'll be helping one in eight Americans. Uh, Harold, how much of a concern is sustainability for the program, you think? I think it's a big concern. I think the, the issue is this is the type of program to me that's pushing what I would say is a socialist agenda by the left to, to, to go toward guaranteed income. And that's what I think this is going toward. And I think the sustainability issue is because this wasn't done through Congress. We're talking about one of the, one of the largest, uh, the largest increase in one of the largest social programs that we have. And it's not done through Congress. It's, it's basically done by the Biden administration, it, essentially adjusting how they, uh, how they look at um, what, what Americans can afford for food. But what that does is it increases the program by, by doing that. And I think that that's what the issue is going to be of, of, you know, making these massive increases in these types of social programs without Congress and without the voice of the people. And the reason they didn't want the voice of the people, because they know that the people don't want, you know, guaranteed income from government, um, essentially going out, you know, through, uh, through various different forms that are guised as good. But ultimately will be to our, our peril, I think. So the guaranteed income that this this would, this uh, increase should have have gone to guaranteed income, you're saying? No, and what I'm saying is this is a form of guaranteed income because it's a permanent increase. Um, and, and I think the administration is trying to push these, these types of guaranteed incomes, be it the, uh, the new child tax credit or, or, uh, or, or other types of guaranteed income. It's, I think it's, that's where this is going, and I think it's, it's ultimately going to cost way too much money and should be done through Congress either way. Well, thank you for clarifying. Steve, you know, what are your thoughts on the ability for uh, this program to really address the nutrition aspect, not so much of just the affordability of, of food, but addressing nutrition? Well, I think it's it's critically important. And I mean, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, people are hungry out there right now in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we People are being evicted from their homes and our kids have just really been struggling, particularly in low income families. So I think this increase in funding can help invest in, you know, nutrition for the kids. You know, food prices are rising. Uh, and I do agree with Harold, we don't want to have a guaranteed income. So but I think we also have to get people working again, get them jobs. Uh, and so that they can work, invest in education, get them out of these economic circumstances where they're having to depend on food stamps to purchase food. Uh, even $169, it's gone up 25% from 36 per person to 169. You know and I know I spend a lot, that a lot more on groceries sometimes 
even when I get things I shouldn't get that, you know, ice cream and things that I want. But the thing is that it's just uh, nutrition is important. Absolutely. And, and, it's it's and, very important. And yeah. this is supposed to be helping to address the issue of more expensive, um, healthier foods. Yes. LA, I'm going to give you the last 60 seconds. Sure. So when we talk about access to, to healthy foods, in North Carolina, 80 out of 100 of our total counties are rural. Out of those 80, we have, guess what, 80 out of 100 counties are considered food deserts. That means the majority of our population, our rural communities, live at least 1 to 10 miles away from a grocery store and don't have a vehicle. So where is their access to healthy food? It's convenience stores and corner stores that has increased the rates of diabetes, high blood pressure. And so when we talk about increasing SNAP and the benefit, it's actually around a dollar and sixty dollar sixty nine cents increase a day. And so I don't consider that a paycheck, right? That's an increase to be able to afford that gas. Uh, maybe, maybe a gallon at these prices of inflation. Guess what? Increasing SNAP at this juncture is a pass to increase, especially when the evaluation of healthy foods have it hasn't been done since 1975. It is 2021. And so we are way behind in providing, guess what? Not just the cost of living for folks who are working every single day to put food on the table, but to make sure that food is actually healthy for their communities so their health disparities aren't exacerbated in a pandemic when barely anyone has health insurance that are actually low income working class folks. Lamisha Whittington, Steve Rao, Harold Eustish, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Deborah. I want to thank all of today's guests. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.